The combination of an Android app and a remote electronic will open a universe of new opportunities for you. But the right way to combine them could be challenging. No worries, no matter where you're starting from, I will show you step by step how to use Android Studio to set up a user interface and I prepared some Kotlin code to take the action from the user interface and send out a Wi-Fi package. On the electronic side we will use a Pi Pico W and if you're new to this I will link you in the description a starting package for Pi Picos. To develop the software on the Pi Pico side we will use Tony and MicroPython. On the Pico we receive the package and define the action we will perform. First thing we gotta do is to download and install Android Studio. We start a new project and choose Empty View Activity. With this preset Android Studio is creating some files for us which help us in the next steps. We click Next, give the project a name and choose a minimum SDK. Depending on the app you plan you need special Android features which are released at different times. You can list this also to get some ideas of the distribution of the features in the versions. We will use Oreo 8.1 to make sure we can implement some additional features features later, then press finish. Now our Android Studio needs some time to set everything up, time to grab a coffee or just watch me doing the nap step and practice it afterwards. When everything is downloaded we have on the left side our folders for the software pass. The first folder is manifest, this is defining the base of the app and which activity to use first. Next folder is Java and here is the activity defined and this is where we will code our Android software. If you are wondering now why is it so confusing and so many things, don't worry, it's really simple and easy to learn. In the beginning it's a bit confusing but afterwards you will get it really fast. And if you wonder now why do we have Java and not Kotlin inside of Android Studio, the reason is Kotlin is an upgrade or extended version of Java perfect design for Android systems and so it's the reason the roots are in some cases the same. Let's come to the part where we start with our interface design. Press res activity main.xml and this is where the magic begins now. We can just drop the buttons and I think that's so amazing. I'm an embedded developer so for me this is really fantastic to drag and drop something and it's directly there. Before we start, close project and make sure that you're in the design view so that that one is activated and none of the other options. Now we can see how our app will look like. At first we delete this hello world, we click on it, hit delete and it's gone. We drag the text view and drop it to the layout and we need some plain text and another text view and two buttons. This is what I mean, drag and drop and finished, cool or? Okay, we are not yet done. First we have to define some sensible IDs to address each part in the code. Let's start with a text field where the user will enter the IP of the Pico. Here we define the ID as text IP. Basically you can choose any ID. But I choose this one for the rest of the software. So if you want to go straight forward with me, you have also to take that name. Press refactor. Then we give the field a start value where our pi normally comes up with. If you don't know this yet, just copy mine and correct it later. As you see now we have millions of attributes for the user interface elements we can define. But now we just search for the size and change it to 24. The rest of the attributes work the same way. The same procedure we do for all others, the buttons will get the ID btn off and btn on, adapt the size and write some nice text on the button. Now we are more or less done with the user interface. But like in a CED we have to set constraints to define exactly the position of the element. So what we have to do is to mark the element, click the point and drag it to the edge. Now by moving it back we define the position by the distance from the edge to that point. The same we do at least on one other point in another dimension. The first element is defined, now we want to have the other ones with the same distance to the edge. We do this by setting the constraint to the other element. Repeat this for all the other elements in the user interface. Congratulations, you have done the first part. The user interface is finished. Let's get ready with a software code and this is extremely easy because we just have to copy it from my github. We open the github link in the description and copy the main activity.kt code into the same file in Android Studio below line number 3. I will go now with you line by line through the code that you can understand it and adapt it to the needs you have. 
On the top we have the import libraries I used. Thanks to our Android we can directly hide them. We scroll down to override on create and this is exactly what it does. We override this function on create with something new. On create is one of the states in the life cycle of Android apps. On create is the only state in Android apps you have to set. The other ones we will discuss in another video later so hit the subscribe button for don't miss what's going on in the next apps. In the next line we set our content to the resource layout main activity. So the user interface we prepared before. And then we create the link between the buttons and the text field in the user interface to our Kotlin code. We do this by the use of the keyword VAL and this is an unchangeable keyword so it's a variable you cannot change like in Java final or constant and C. If you want to have something adaptable you have to use a keyword VAR which stands for variable and you can change it afterwards. Now we need to find the element and we do this with the help of the type and the ID which we defined in the user interface and the text field input we translate directly into a variable. The next code block is needed because Android does not allow every app to have internet communication. We need the communication so we need this block, you don't need to change it. The next part is where the action starts. We define a button listener and this is exactly what it does. When someone presses the button, the code will be executed. It's comparable with an interrupt in a better world. Is a button clicked, we read out the IP address, send out a toast message and call the send package function with the IP address and the string on. For the button off, we do exactly the same, but just with the off string. Perfect, the interface between the Kotlin code and the user interface is defined so they can communicate with each other. What we have to do now is to set up the socket to use the internet connection. But don't worry, that's already in the code. We will start with the inner code of the function. At first we define a timeout of one second, then I have a function to create a JSON package. I could also send this message directly as a string, but in the next videos I want to grow this function so I directly start with a good structure. Next step is creating a socket. A socket is extremely helpful when it comes to IP communication. Without having a socket I would need to set up all the communication on my own. But luckily a network is layer oriented, so I just have to drop the package with the IP address and the port and the rest is the job of the operational system. Then we try to establish a connection so we define the socket address with the IP and the server port. For the port you can use more or less everything you like to. It has to be a port which is unrestricted and it has to be the same on the Android and on the Pi side as well. And then we call the connect method with the timeout we defined before. The timeout is important because it could be that the IP address we entered is wrong or that the Pi Pico is not awake at all. For the user it wouldn't be that bad, but for the operational system it's spamming it with a lot of sockets and connections it don't need. So it's killing them if they are doing nothing. And this would crash our app and this is really annoying so we have to use a timeout and make it correctly. If the connection is established we create a writer and flush the message. At the end we write into the log cat that we sent successfully our message. If we run into a timeout or another exception was called we create an error log and at the end we close the socket. Now let's come to the outer part. And here we are defining an own thread for the communication. The reason why we do this is that the communication is dealing with waiting times. And network communication we call them blocking code. And the operational system Android doesn't allow any blocking code inside of the main thread, which is absolutely sensible. One last thing we got to do before we can run our app the first time is to set the internet permission. We do this by clicking to the manifest and we add here the line uses permission android double score name android permission dot internet. You could also copy this from a video description. Bam! It's done. So we can hit the run button and check what's going on. Just hit the play symbol and go for it. Now we can test it and we can figure out that the other side is not responding but we expected this because we didn't set up the other side. Isn't that cool? But there are two things I don't like. The first thing is it's coming up with an Android logo instead of another logo. And the second thing is I want to have it on my phone and not on my computer. So fix it. At first we need a picture of 512 times 512 pixel. I use PNG type. Then we click rest, right button, image is set. 
So there you select your picture, resize it to fit it perfectly, switch to background color tab, select the color, press next and check that the source is set on main and hit finish. Now everything is updated and when I press the play button again, the new logo will appear by starting the app. Perfect, but I still want it on my phone. What we have to do is to set the phone to a developer mode. This is different for every phone and my phone, I just open the smartphone settings about the phone version. Now I have to tip seven times very fast on the build number. Now your phone is in developer mode. Open developer settings, Wi-Fi debug, connect over QR code. In the Android Studio, press the drop down and select pair device using Wi-Fi. And then you have it on your phone. Cool? Perfect, we are finished with our first app. Isn't it cool? So now we switch to the Pi Pico stuff. On the Raspberry website, we download the UF2 file, then we connect the Pico while we press the button. The Explorer open with a new drive, then we drop the file, the Pico will restart. Now the Pico is ready, let's install Tony. We download and install Tony and open it afterwards. Click Tools, Settings, Interpreter and choose MicroPython. Now we go again to my GitHub repository and copy the code of main.py, paste it and save it as main.py on the Pico. Great, first thing is done. Now we need to set up the Wi-Fi connection that is in the same network as my smartphone, otherwise they cannot communicate with each other. So we go into the code and here I saved my SSID and password in a separate file so I can import it and use this function to load it to my code. You could also set up the SSID and the password by your own directly in the code, but for making videos this is really unpractical. So now we try 10 times to connect to the Wi-Fi. If it fails, we raise an error. If not, we write the IP address. And this is exactly the address we need. Normally in modern networks, the devices come up with the same address after a restart. So probably the next time you will rake your Pi, it's coming up with the same IP. So write it down and give it directly into the app. Then we define a pin where we connect our load to. And the next step, we are setting on a socket again. So this time as a server, so we have to wait for a client to connect. And here it's important again to listen on the correct port, otherwise we don't get a functional communication. If you're wondering now, hey, this is also a blocking code, why is it running on the main thread? You're completely right, but in this example, the Pi Pico doesn't have anything to do instead of waiting for a client to connect and to serve him, so we can run it on the main thread. When we receive now a package, we decode it, read out the JSON command and decide what to do. Cool, we're done! Let's try it! At first run your program in the Tony, then you get the IP address and when you have this IP address you can give it into your app and there you can test your program and everything is working. Well, great! It works! Really cool! But there are two things I don't like in this app. The first thing is that I have to set up the IP address and the second thing is that I cannot read back the stage from the CPIOs. So we will fix this in the next video. I will upload it here when it's finished. So see you there.